Mr. President, members of the Georgia Tech faculty and staff, graduates, their families and friends, it is a pleasure and a great honor to speak to you this afternoon. First, I want to add my sincere congratulations to our graduates. I know that you have worked hard to get to this day, an effort that required your unflinching commitment and some sacrifices. I suspect that there are often things that you would have rather done than study for an upcoming exam, but you did it. And now you're about to graduate from one of the top universities in the world. For that, you certainly deserve our recognition and congratulations. But I also know that most of you did not arrive at this day alone. The challenges you faced were faced with the support and assistance of your family and friends. And we should certainly acknowledge the professors who led you, inspired you, challenged you, and today join you in the celebration of your achievement. As President Peterson told you a moment ago, I am here to address you because I am the 2017 recipient of Georgia Tech's Distinguished Professor Award. I am extraordinarily, extraordinarily proud to have been recognized by my colleagues with that award. This honor comes at a time in my career and in my life when it is natural to look back and contemplate the path I've taken, the mistakes I've made, and a few of the things I've learned along that way. That path passed through graduation ceremonies, much like the one we're attending today. It took me from the research laboratory to a faculty office and a lecture hall, and then to service in university administration at the University of Illinois and here at Georgia Tech. In looking back over those 40 years and thinking about speaking here today, I wondered if a few of the things I learned might be helpful to you as your journey continues forward. But first, I'm going to assume that many of you will soon have a leadership role. In fact, based on where we are and what we are doing today, I'm certain that nearly all of you are headed toward leadership positions. You may soon be leading a team focused on a technical or business challenge, and some of you, perhaps not long from now, will be leading complex organizations. It's no secret, of course, that leadership will require you to make decisions that will affect you and the others for whom you are responsible. Now, I don't want to frighten you on a day dedicated to celebration. But everyone who has ever held leadership responsibility knows that decision making can be extraordinarily difficult. I suspect that most of you already know that. Making a wise decision is difficult because it is absolutely always true that the decision must be made with incomplete information. That's a truism because it is impossible for any of us to foresee the future and the wisdom of the decision will become apparent only sometime into that future. Moreover, by definition, leaders lead people and people often act in ways that are impossible to predict. And there are deadlines. Doing nothing usually just won't cut it. So what's a leader to do? How is the right answer or the best path forward found? How will you know what to do? Okay, I know what you're thinking. Here it comes. He's going to tell us again the top 10 things every leader needs to know. Well, you're wrong. I'm not going to do that because if you Google that question, in a half a second, you will have 33,800,000 answers. That should be enough. Okay. Instead, I'm going to tell you about three Nobel Prizes. Not prizes in chemistry. I know you're disappointed. 
but Nobel Prizes in Economics. Those prize winners, Frederick von Hayek, Daniel Kahneman, and Richard Thaler, are not purely economists. They're part philosopher and part behavioral psychologist. And they thought deeply about human behavior and applied their discoveries to decision making. When the Nobel Committee awarded the 1974 Economics Prize to Hayek, they remarked that he started his career in pure economic theory, but later broadened his horizon to social and institutional behavior. There is just one aspect of his work that I will mention today, but it's a big one. How can you know the right thing to do? Hayek identified three broad strategies. The first is reasoned analysis. Scientists and engineers are especially attracted to this approach. You line up all of the inputs, you list all of the possible outcomes, and then you construct a logical path from available inputs to desired outcomes. Seems really simple. Except, Hayek points out that in a complex system, especially when people are involved, there are no infallible logical paths. There are too many variables, many of them unknown, and even a small perturbation in such a nonlinear system can result in a huge outcome change. He's right. History is packed with stories of how a simple misunderstanding initiated a chain of events that destroyed an empire. So if reasoned analysis won't work, what's left? Hayek points next to instinct. Sometimes we just know what the proper decision is. It seems so obviously the right choice that it requires no other justification. Again, it seems simple, except that Hayek tells us that our instincts evolved in a time when we humans lived exclusively in isolated groups of no more than about a thousand people. And that those instincts are not completely reliable in a world of global interconnectedness. Of course, he's right. It's undeniable. We've all seen it. People often accept and, and act on false stereotypes and instinctual beliefs, even when they defy logic. OK, so what's a person to do if reason and instinct cannot always be relied on? Haig suggests that custom and tradition often provide a good guide. Traditions are rules of behavior followed by a group of people who don't necessarily understand their origin or realize their impact. Hayek emphasized traditions because they evolve to meet needs. Those that don't work are forgotten. Successful traditions are spread broadly. Traditions are a way for us to acquire and act on the wisdom, insight, and perspectives of the past. Tradition. Pause for a moment and think about we're, what we're doing here today. We are wearing academic regalia that dates from the 13th century. And I walked in carrying the mace, a symbol of military authority from the 15th century. Why are we doing this? Of course, there is no logical explanation. But we trust the wisdom of the past and celebrate this important day of tradition, of transition, with ancient symbols and ceremonies. Our next noblest is Daniel Kahneman. He won the prize in 2002. He raises bright red flags to warn us of the many ways we are skilled at deceiving ourselves when we make decisions. Kahneman divides human cognition and action into two broad categories. The first is a fast, automatic, intuitive approach that Kahneman calls System 1. The second, System 2, is slower, analytical, and reasoned. System 2 is the rational, thoughtful person we like to think we are. But Kahneman shows that it's system one that makes most of our decision. Sometimes system two comes in later, only when necessary, if we try to justify those decisions. Unfortunately, 
Fast System 1 makes a lot of mistakes. Allow me to paraphrase some conclusion from Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. First, a reliable way of making people believe falsehoods is frequent repetition. We often confuse familiarity with truth. Advertisers, of course, know this. Mm -hmm. Moreover, our confidence in a belief depends mostly on the quality of the story we make up that link the parts of the story we see, even when those are only a small fraction of the whole story and are not even true. This decision-making error is so common, it has become part of our language. We call it jumping to a conclusion. Also, we overestimate how much we understand about cause and effect and regularly underestimate the role random chance plays in events. That's why casinos in Las Vegas get rich and gamblers get poor. And finally, Kahneman warns that the illusion that we understand the past generates overconfidence in our ability to predict the future. Now here's the scary part. Psychologists have found that the more complex the decision, the more likely we are to use error-prone, overconfident, prejudiced, narrow-minded system one. So future leaders, you would be well advised when facing an important decision to slow down and engage thoughtful system two as you try to balance reason, instinct, and tradition. The final Nobel Prize winner of the afternoon is Richard Thaler, who received the 2017 prize this year for investigating how limited rationality, social prejudices, and lack of self-control affect decisions. Wow, let me repeat that. Decisions are often made based on limited rationality, social prejudices, and lack of self-control. That sounds pretty scary. One of the important things Thaler taught us is that we confuse ourselves by assigning different arbitrary labels to things that are really the same. Money is an example that we're all pretty familiar with. I don't think I need to convince you that a dollar is a dollar. However, we often create personal budgets with categories to help us spend our money wisely. For example, you might have a category for clothes but then you unexpectedly receive some clothes for your birthday. Thaler showed that we still often continue to spend the entire clothing budget to buy clothes, even though we don't need them, rather than shift that money to a different, more beneficial use. That's a simple but telling example of the danger of arbitrary labels. In the real world, many of the critical decisions leaders make involve allocation of resources. It's necessary that we make sure that we have not fallen into Thaler's trap of arbitrary labels before deciding, for example, to spend the excess funds in the equipment budget on new iPhones rather than they use that money to give our best employees a bonus. Okay, it's not my intention this afternoon to leave you in great doubt about your decision-making ability. In fact, I'm pretty confident that you are already pretty skilled in that art. After all, you're here today. But there is no doubt that even the most skilled decision-makers can learn something from these three Nobel Prize winners. Personally, I've learned to slow down and think about the assumptions I've made. That is, I try to engage Kahneman System 2 to examine the logic, fairness, and consistency of the decision I'm about to make. Without forgetting, of course, that Hayek warned me that neither logic, instinct, or tradition are infallible. And finally, I challenged the decision by assessing Thaler's arbitrary labels trap. Have I really examined all of the available options? It works for me. Perhaps these thoughts will be valuable to you also. Finally, and maybe this is the most important part, I want to remind you of one last thing, 
and that's the advice of folk philosopher Bobby McFerrin, whose 1988 worldwide hit song is titled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. We appreciate you.